Good morning to all of you. A warm welcome to our Zoom webinar organized by GMOI and Society for Health Research and Innovation. Today, our lecture is going to be on common problems in newborns. Kindly mute your microphone and turn off the camera during the presentation and use the chat box to clear your doubts at the end of the session. Now, it's my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Sanjeeva Thinakon, consultant neonatologist, currently attached to the Colombo North Teaching Hospital. Thank you for joining us today, and the floor is yours. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks for being with us despite your busy schedules. I know everybody is busy uh, during this COVID period, but uh, just to upgrade your knowledge about uh, neonates, I thought of continuing this lecture. So we'll uh, talk about uh, common neonatal problems that you all face day to day. And uh, uh, sometimes I might not be going through all the slides, content of the all slides because of the time factor. So, uh, so as a medical officer directly involving the patient care these days, uh, you might be encountering certain neonatal problems, common problems. So just, uh, this is not a new thing, but we are just brushing up your knowledge and we are just polishing up your knowledge to give a good patient care. Right, so, uh, so newborns, you know, newborns are the most precious gift on earth for a, a couple of par parents. Uh, therefore, I mean, the, they have big hope on the baby. They are a bit anxious. Therefore, sometimes the real problem is a bit exaggerated. You know that. So sometimes these problems are not real problems. They are just a worrying factor for mother, father, as well as the grandparents. But keep it in mind. Don't ignore it. Just get the problem into your lab and solve it. Otherwise, they will lose the grip and they will go to somebody else and they will end up in some quack or some irrational practitioner. Therefore, always listen to their problems positively and always encourage them and always be empathic on them and get their problems. Sometimes they are not, may not be much on the problem, but just give a solution and just uh, allow them to talk and listen to them and give a solution. Right. So pay your attention to the problem. You know, during this period, during the puparium, mother is very fragile. She is like a eggshell, very fragile. So because of the hormonal changes, because of the uh, first time experience of a childbearing, she is very uh, fragile and a lot of pressure on her. father, mother, as well as the uh, mother-in-law. So many family members are putting their ideas, putting their opinions on the baby, right? This is, I mean, a bit of a uh, hazard just for the mother and a bit of a stressful for mother. So when the mother comes to you with a problem, with a concern about baby, so don't just ignore it. Just take it to your own lap, own hand and try to settle it, right? So always try to encourage them and try to get the real problem out of them. So no mother will say that I, I have got enough breastfeeding. I have got, I'm satisfied with the breastfeeding, right? So everybody has problems with the breastfeeding. Say, Ani Dr. Matakiri Madhi Eno Agi. Kisi Mama Kene Kiya Ne Matakiri Eno Ati Kiya. So that is the real concern of the baby. They are concerned that their volume is not enough. They are concerned that baby is not, baby is going to be uh, hungry, baby is going to be hypoglycemic. So just get the question onto your lap and explain them about the situation and give them their solutions. Otherwise, what will happen, they will go for quick solutions like formula, right? So formula is, you know, there are a lot of side effects. It's a quick solution. And most of our, I'm not that happy to say, no, most of our colleagues, they don't have enough time to spend on one patient especially regarding breastfeeding. So they just quickly, they prescribe formula, which is not good at all. All of you know that formula contains a lot of palm oil and unnecessary chemicals. So we, as a GMO, we have been telling this for last 10 to 15 years. This palm oil is a really toxic product and it uh, has really detrimental effect on the newborn. 
and uh, at last it might end up in so many other uh, complications therefore don't promote uh, formula in the in case of breastfeeding failure which the breastfeeding failure is the commonest problem that you uh, encounter in your practice so we'll talk about breastfeeding but in case of breastfeeding i know that you need time to attend time to engage time to listen to mother's story time to give solutions it's not a one minute uh, or five minute or ten minute session it takes about one or two days or three days or four days or five days sometimes week or one or two weeks is to get rid of the problem but be patient and go with the patient and you may have to get the get down the pay, uh, mother and the mother's uh, i mean parents and mother-in-law several times to settle this problem right but it's still worth because just by uh, giving a substitute for breastfeeding just by giving a, uh, what do you call formula for this uh, problem you will end up in mess so very formula is very attractive why it will keep the baby fat right it will keep the baby very flushy and very fluffy which will make the mother happy right but it's not healthy you know the babies might end up in a uh, lot of uh, allergies a lot of uh, infections and a lot of uh, non communicable diseases this is later stage therefore breast milk you have to encourage it and with the time you have to settle it so you have to take the mothers opinion and take listen to the mother very carefully and then you have to tell your version saying that amma me podi kale oy ochchrama kiyen taram breast milk volume ekak lokuwata onne baba age bada podi strawberry gediyak wage podi volume ekak thamai one right oy tv ekey penna wage lokuwata baba pae ganak bonna awashya ne podda beepu gaman bada pirena ay golla hari e wageema එයා හරියට දවසට පස් පාරක් විතර චූදානවා නම් දවසට දෙපාරක් තුන් පාරක් බවල් ඕපන් වෙනවා නම් ඒකෙන් කියන්නේ ඇති කියලා හරි mothers think that mothers has to express 100 120 ml per one go no it's not like that right to tell the mother and certain other social factors are also influencing the mother mother in law mother's mother so many other uh, helpers might come and give a uh, various opinions about breastfeeding so therefore try to get the mother uh, under your control the way to get do that is listen to mother patient don't jump on her whatever she says whatever she is trying to say get it positively and encourage and sometimes i know that because of your busy schedule you are not uh, i mean i mean you are not in a position to handle her but you know every base hospital and above has a lactation management center right so refer the man, uh, mother to lactation management center right there you have very well trained nurses right very well trained nurses, very well trained midwives very well trained doctors in the case of doctors is always to better to be handled by a female doctors because mother can truly come with her concerns so always give a merit to mother saying that amma ada hondai ada yeta wada godak improve la thiyena best feeling always give positive feedback on mother and keep on going it might take one or two weeks to settle but it's real worth rather than starting formula right so keep on referring the keep on getting the child for one or two or three or four occasions it's always better to refer the mother to breastfeeding center lactation management center and keep a slow going process to improve breastfeeding and sometimes mothers need psychological support as well just by saying amma breast milk is the best is better than formula you have to give breast milk will not going to help most of the mothers are depressed because when they go home mother mother in law is a ane kiri mati kiri mati kiri mati that's a very hurting word for the mother very hurting word for a female it's like saying you are ugly right so so always go for psychological support in my case i always refer to female psychiatrist so she will always encourage her 
mood that will really help right so always better to handle by a female doctor so mother can really come with the own uh, problems and not only breastfeeding so there are accompanying problem as well one thing so her sleep right her sleep has to be improved because you know uh, let down reflex improves in sleep let down reflex uh, i mean uh, improves in during sleeping oxytocin fatigue that will improve while you're sleeping therefore allow mother to sleep when the baby is sleeping don't occupy the mother for other household work like washing clothes looking out the other child so always when the baby is sleeping allow mothers to sleep so that will improve the letdown reflex that will make more milk and be very cautious about mother's food intake during this time mothers i mean they are in a bit of a depressed state therefore they don't eat much but that's not going to help breastfeeding so always encourage them to take you know this traditional they call it uh, jackfruit and tender jack those are really helpful right so at least help them to get three main meals per day and some additional meals like what like triposha like so many other nutritious stuff uh during the lactation period so don't allow them to take coffee and caffeine so coffee and caffeine containing foods they will disturb the sleep so disturbing the sleep will have a negative effect on breastfeeding right and do not allow to take substances which cause constipation constipation is a has a negative impact on breastfeeding so uh, allow mother to take a lot of fruit a lot of fiber containing diet and discourage them taking chocolate and a lot of short short teas and coffee right and the other thing is always help the mother in positioning the baby sometimes because of the cesarean wound because of the spinal scar they are not in a position to handle the baby right so proper positioning will help the mother's breastfeed so breast milk is the most appropriate and natural food for the baby so it will protect the baby against infection like diarrhea you know if the mother is 28 years old all the infection that she had had been encountered by antibodies which are deposited in the bone marrow and which will be transmitted to the baby via the breast milk so it protects the baby against diarrhea bronchitis pneumonia immunological and uh, so you know even for immunological disorders it will give us protection for the baby right then so you have a lot of positive effects on breastfeeding uh, favors uterine contraction and reduces the reduces pph reduces the uterine ovarian breast cancer lactation amr helps in family planning and it saves money and decreases the need for medical consultancies and drugs and especially when you uh, are preparing formula milk it takes a lot of time right to boil the thing you have to do so many uh, other things to get a proper formula feeding therefore it consumes a lot of money and time right and uh, how do you, how are going to start as soon as the baby is born you have to start breastfeeding there's nothing called within one hour or i mean if early as possible why is that because when the time of uh, child delivery they don't feel that much of pain right but after 2 hours they get severe pain which is which will in in inhibit the let down reflex which will have a negative effect on the breastfeeding so as soon as if you start feeding the so breastfeeding will be started there will be free flow right so so there will be enough let down reflex but if you are to start it bit late the mothers will have a lot of pain on the spine pain of the uh, scars that will have a negative effect on breastfeeding right so start it soon as possible right then so breastfeeding must be on demand it should be demand feeds not too early not three hour but should be a demand feeds so when the baby needs it you have to know baby needs it right then you have to look for the breastfeeding right there's no timetable for breastfeeding right it's totally depend on baby's demand so you have to know the hunger cues so early mid and late so i'm not going to describe them one by one because the one hour lecture might take some time to describe you can get it copied and read it right so always 
attachment is a problem. If you give a good attachment, nipple as well as areola, almost all areola is in the mouth. So it fixes very well and baby can suck very well. But if the in the bad, case of bad attachment, only the nipple is inside, right? So that, that allows a lot of air uh, going freely into the baby's GI system, which will uh, distend the baby and which can give colics and it's a vicious, vicious cycle and baby will not feed from the mother, right? And changing the question help in prevention of mastitis and it will improve the uh, flow. So therefore, always not a single portion. You must try various portions at various times. Even during sleep, while you are sitting, while you are standing, you can give, uh, you can try various portions which will actually help in uh, improve the letdown reflex and in turn it will make more and more milk. Right? Right. So difficulties during breastfeeding, I, I told you, always should be handled by a, good to be handled by a female person because mother can come with a real problem. So uh, LMC is there, lactation management centers are there, all base hospitals and above, they have uh, lactation management centers. So mother has to be examined thoroughly and inverted nipple, flat nipples, actually these problems has to be dealt at the level of antenatal period. It's better to delta the antenatal period so then the problems can be encountered from antenatal period and when the child is born the problems are almost solved then uh, crack nipples can be a sign of poor attachment so that if you're getting a, if you're getting a crack nipple that means babies uh, is not positioned very well right so you position the baby very well and you can apply colostrum on the crack nipple crack nipple so that will heal the practical soon as possible or some you can apply vitamin E cream or vitamin E capsule crack, I mean crushed capsule can be applied which will heal it and you have to position the baby very well uh, placing the nipple and the almost all part of the areola into mouth then it will uh, will be healed automatically right so then breast engorgement it's become hard, swollen, sensitive, and tight, and dry, and red skin with very painful breast. So, a uh, solution is once again you have to uh, express the breast milk and get it to a cup and st start cup feeding from what you have extracted. And if the baby breast is engorged, always do a cold, cold compression, not warm compression. If you give warm compression, it will be aggravated. So, give cold compressions and reduce the pain and painkillers sometimes. If the uh, area is very red and swollen, you, you can start antibiotics and keep on expressing that will settle the problem, right? So then we'll go back to our other problems. So uh, other, because I was very, very worried about the way our people were handling the breastfeeding issues. Uh, so many uh, formulas has been prescribed. I have seen that, that's why I wanted to tell you this problem first, the, the problem of breastfeeding, though even, even though we think it's a, not that a, a serious problem, I think out of all these problems, the most serious mistake done by us, that is prescribing formula. Formula is, I mean, it's a medical prescription, sometimes in premature babies, sometimes in multiple pregnancies, formula might be helpful, but you have to think twice whether actually formula is really needed or not, because you know, by giving formula, sometimes you may be doing harm than good in long term. You are definitely doing a harm than, than good. Therefore, just think twice and uh, be patient and always refer to be patient to LMC Lactation Management Center and try to establish breastfeeding as much as possible. So, looking into the neonatal problem, it's, a, it's a because. So this is a transition period from uh, intrauterine to extrauterine life. So therefore it's a complex process involving virtually every organ system in the body. The most dramatic changes are seen in lung and the cardio system. Failure to adequately make the transition can be life setting and these infants often require supportive care. In order to select the optimal intervention, it is essential to understand the normal physiology of the respiration and cardiovascular transition, right? right. So you have to know the general appearance of the newborn, full term, uh, they are very, dark purple, red in color, their movements are very symmetrical, they are vigorously crying with uh, months in, 
be devoted because lying with the accompanying activity of the arms and legs lying with extreme motionless to conserve the energy for uh breathing right so they are in flex extremities sign of good muscle tone that means sign of good muscle tone and hands are tightly fisted with thumb covered by the fingers okay but some uh, you can see a baby who is crying and baby is very pink uh, all extremities are uh, i mean uh, that, uh, not moving but he is crying but in a case of breech presentation you can see the babies in a sometimes some some person called frog posture is in the lower down right so uh, that is how the uh, newborns look look like so you have to know about bit of a vital normal vital signs respiration with the rate varies from 30 to 60 per minute average is 40 right so heart rate 100 to 60 uh, 100 while sleeping 160 while crying right temperature rectal is a bit higher than normal uh, 37.5 actually is some uh, somewhere around 37 so blood pressure uh, average is 75 to 42 systolic is 6 to 80 diastolic varies from 40 to 50 those are the uh, normal variations right so as i told you from beginning ma many problems are uh, transient they are benign right you need to just to explain the parents about the problem right but some needs your attention some need your intervention so to differentiate these things you need to get good detailed history thorough evaluation uh, evaluation and complete physical examination is needed to differentiate between uh, the problems that you need intervention and the problem that you don't need intervention right so benign condition that you are facing vernix caseosa that is whitish uh, cheesy like covering on the newborn skin produced by epithelial cell breakdown this will facilitate facilitate the vaginal canal uh, i mean the delivery of the baby so that that contains a lot of uh, lubricant like thing which will facilitate the normal delivery right that prevents trans epidermal water loss so that will prevent prevent hypothermia as well so now they have found certain kind of immunoglobulin now also they are therefore don't pipe it vigorously and remove it let them go off automatically right will fall, fall off in one to two weeks time removing the vernix uh, for cosmetic reasons is not recommended because it gives some protection to the skin uh, from outside organisms right and it is a sort of protection for hypothermia as well right so we are a bit worried about acrocyanosis that is peripheral cyanosis but peripheral cyanosis is can be due to hypothermia due to low temperature in the environment right therefore don't get i mean uh, just uh, reassure the parents this is uh, peripheral cyanosis which happens in the peripheries of the legs and peripheries of the uh, upper limbs but always check the tongue if the tongue is also cyanose, you have to be really worried because it's a sinister cause because it might be a central cyanose. But if the tongue is pink and uh, peripheries are cyanose, you don't have to worry. So that must be a local reason. Local reason may be hypothermia or uh, uh, baby is exposed to cold or baby is exposed to air conditioner. So therefore, you can reassure them men. Uh, but always examine the tongue, right? So best engorgement. So always this can be en engorged due to maternal hormonal activity. So always check whether the uh, it is redden and uh, redden and inflamed. If it is redden and inflamed, somebody might have squeezed it. So this normal breast engorgement is very very normal. It's due to maternal hormonal changes. But with maternal hormonal changes, when maternal hormone levels goes down, it will settle on his own. But in our traditional, some people in our culture, some people believe that it should be squeezed out, which is very dangerous, which can uh, infect the breast tissue and which will give a, which will, which will collect pus in the breast tissue and which will be very uh, painful for the way. And sometimes we may have to put an excision and drain the pus, right? So therefore, uh, never allow them to squeeze. Just reassure them it will settle on this on their own. 
when the maternal hormone levels goes down, right? Milia, it's a multiple one to two millimeter yellow white cystic lesions, right? Affected almost 40% of the babies. Right. On most commonly over the cheeks, forehead, nose, and nasolabial folds due to block sebaceous glands. Known as Epstein pearls when they occur in the oral cavity. Self-limited and are reabsorbed within uh, book says three months, but within one or two months it will be settled. You don't have to do anything, right? Milli area, that's heat trash, small erythematous papules and pustules on the forehead, neck, upper trunk. Usually after first week of life, resulting from occlusion of the and rupture of the sweat ducts in the skin. But that is also it's a self-limiting thing. Uh, might be responding to avoidance of overheating, removal of excessive clothing and cool days will help. And applying tropical creams will might worsen the scenario. Therefore, don't apply anything. Let it settle on its own, right? Erythema toxicum, we call it Ratha. Uh, Ratha Gaia. Ratha, we call it sometimes they give Ratha Kalke, which is not uh, any more recommended. Very common rash occurs in almost 50%. Small white, yellow papules and pustules. Sometimes it may turn into red. Uh, you should develop two to three, three, three days after births, pairing the palms and so. Lesions seem to be migrated by disappearing within hours and then reappearing elsewhere. It's all within two weeks. Don't apply anything. Don't recommend Ratha Kalke because Ratha Kalke contains a lot of uh, uh, products which are not recommended. It might be. Uh, damage kidneys and it might damage uh, liver. Therefore, uh, reassure the parents that it will settle on their own. Don't do anything, right? Transit neonatal pustular melanosis, small superficial white pustules on the non erythematous base present at the time of delivery on the neck, back, and extremities and palms or soles. New lesions do not usually appear after birth. That is very characteristic. The lesions are static. No more new lesions, right? Often resolving within two to three days. Don't do anything. I uh, don't apply creams. It might, uh, I mean, it might block further sweat glands and might worsen the condition. Therefore, don't apply anything. Just let it disappear on, on its own, right? Sucking blisters, flaxseed bullet, five to 15 millimeters, produced by vigorous sucking of the, uh, during the fetal period may evolve quickly to erosion, resolve in days, in days, not actually weak. Characteristic locations are radial, forearm, wrist, hand, uh, no need of treatment, it will settle on its own, right? By applying some cream and uh, applying powder won't help the healing process, right? Mongolian blue spots, mothers are really worried. Cosmetically, especially it happens in female babies, but make sure that it's a just a temporary thing, uh, which is due to some vascular uh, malformations, actually venous malformation, but it will disappear by six to, uh, during six months to one year time, it will disappear and it will not reappear again. Therefore, they are really, effect, uh, they are really worried about the cosmetic effect of the uh, Mongolian blows, but make sure that it will disappear in six to, six to 12 months won't persist in the uh, longer period, right? Strawberry hemangiomas, bright red, raised well circumscribed lesions can be found all over the place. Grow rapidly during the six months, continue to grow till one year. More common in head, neck and trunk in premature babies and might regress after one year, but sometimes large strawberry hemangiomas can lead to bleeding. Therefore, and sometimes large ones, if you get a large one on the skin, you may have to do a scan, ultrasound scan to see whether it has any continuation in the inside organs also. Therefore, uh, depending on the uh, place where it appears, uh, plan for further investigation. If it appears on the face, nearby the eye, nearby the nose, and nearby the mouth, always uh, uh, make a suspicion whether it has uh, it, it has some continuation in the uh, inside the inside the skull. Therefore, uh, and when when it happens in the abdomen also, make sure 
by doing ultrasound uh, abdomen, it doesn't appear on the inside the abdomen, right? So if it is uh, going larger, it might lead into bleeding, it might lead to well, it might lead to heart failure, and it might get infected. Therefore, uh, wait for some time. If it doesn't uh, resolve, uh, you can apply steroid cream and you can start propanolol and get the plastic surgeon's advice. They can cauterize it. They can do various sort of treatment modalities to remove that, right? So basically corticosteroids and propanolol treatment will help to remove that. Kephalo hematomas, when you are struggling with the delivery, when the delivery uh, baby gets stuck on the vaginal canal and you are pulling the baby out, you get a kephalo hematoma. It's a collection between the tight skin of the uh, uh, cranium and the bone, right? So it's very well, the place is very well uh, demarcated to the bone. Therefore, it's, it can be a bit painful, right? So the problem is the bleeding into that cavity is very painful because it's a very tight compartment. And uh, in with, with time to come, the blood will degrade and it might end up in jaundice. It might be a focus for jaundice, right? Therefore, just give some pain relief. So mother's worries, it will persist and the head shape of the head will be the same. No, you have to reassure the mother, it will absorb on its own. And we don't have to do anything else, but keep an eye on jaundice, right? So if it is very painful and tight, it's always due to, it's always better to give some paracetamol. That is 15 milligram per kg, uh, three times a day for three days, just to avoid the tenderness and pain, right? So it's maybe due to prolonged stage two labor. Instrumental delivery is uh, one of the known causes of kephalo hematoma. The mishappened head can cause some parental alarm, right? So they might think that it still persists. Periosteal swelling can also be present. Boundaries is limited by bony margin. That's not cross the midline. That's a characteristic feature, right? Then caput succeeding, that is also due to so boggy, diffuse edematous swelling or soft tissues of scalp over the presenting part, the swelling is present at birth and the size and severity is related to the duration of labor. So swelling is pitting on fluxion and not liberated by sutures, unlike capillary It disappears spontaneously over the next few days, but that also can be very painful. Therefore, uh, always, uh, if it's painful, give some paracetamol, 15 milligrams per kg, three times a day, right? So in case of uh, females, female newborns, you get vaginal bleeding due to maternal hormone imbalance. It's almost like menstruation, but in a small quantity, small volume, but uh, uh, it's really a matter of concern for parents. Parents might uh, bring the child running to you, saying that the bleeding has occurred. They want to do something to stop bleeding. Once again, you have to uh, tell the pathophysiology this is something very similar to menstrual bleeding because of the maternal hormones. The bleeding occur and uh, after, uh, I mean, uh, maternal hormone levels go down, it will automatically stop. But keep an eye on that. Don't neglect the uh, bleeding. But if it is very severe, once again, you may have to review with the cardiac profile, right? So same same in the case of mucos, uh, mucoid vaginal secretions. Most female babies have, have thin grayish white mucoid vaginal secretion. This should not be mistaken for parulent discharge. So that is also mucoid vaginal secretion also due to maternal hormone changes, but it will settle on its own. We don't have to do anything, right? Curate crystals. So when you get a diaper, you may get a red color marks on the diaper. So parents are alarmed. It, they might think there's bleeding has occurred in in, uh, in the urine tract and they might come to you once again uh, make uh, explain them that these are the red, red crystals so that might find uh, intermittent in the diapers in first week it will disappear on its own but it can be a mark of inadequate hydration also if you increase the hydration if you properly correct the hydration it will disappear on its own right Cutis mammata is not that common in Sri Lanka, but it's a bluish mottling of skin in response to chilling, stress, or overstimulation. It solves quickly within warming. It's very common in cold countries. Onset during first two to four weeks of life due to immaturity of the autonomic nervous system, right? It persists 
if first after the infant is warmed implies an obstruction to blood flow such as hyperviscosity like IPCV or vasculitis, right? So persistence beyond neonatal period is a possible marker for trisomy 18 uh, and Down syndrome. Therefore, if it disappeared by two to four, week, four weeks, you don't have to worry. But if it doesn't disappear, you have to uh, check the PCV, back cell volume, and think about certain syndromes, which can, which is a uh, presenting features, cutis morota, right? Like trisomy and trisomy 18, trisomy 21 and 18, right? So subconjunctival hemorrhage is very common after normal vaginal delivery, delivery when the baby gets head gets stuck in the vagina. S uh, small vessels in the eyes get ruptured and bleeding can occur uh, bilaterally in the conjunctiva. But uh, by, by seeing this, parents might get agitated and alerted. So they might think that it's a serious condition, but we have to may, uh, explain them this will absorb on his own and you don't have to do anything but keep an eye on this because if further bleeding occurs it might be a very uh, rare presentation of bleeding manifestation right nasolacrimal duct obstruction so most of the time parents will come to you excessive tearing right excessive tearing sometimes uh, pus also may be there uh, then uh, you have to e examine the eye. If the soft tissue surrounding the eye is also swollen and edematous, you have to think about the eye infection, but most of the time it's not like that, just a lacrimation only. So that is due to approximately 6% of newborn, one or both of the lacrimal duct is blocked, preventing drainage of, of tears. So affected children appear to have excessive tearing. 90% blocked, ducts open spontaneously by six months of age, otherwise you have to massage it three times a day that will open the duct automatically right warm compress or massage from outer or inner can canal force milk the duct result in resolution of majority of cases if second early infected may need topical antibiotics just see whether the surrounding tissue is reddened and inflamed and infected if it is so just give a eye drop right weight loss which is a really hurting word for the mother so you know, the weight loss is any baby loses about 10% of weight during first 14 days. So that is physiological, right? But you have to tell the mother this is very normal. Everybody, every every newborn loses 10% of weight during the first 14 hours, right? You have to tell that. If, if it is not so, you if you're just going to say that baby has lost 7%, say 8% or 9%, it really hurts. The mother will think only her child has lost the weight, right? Which is, it's again, once again, it's a negative impact on the breastfeeding. When you hurt the mother, when you disturb the mother, it also hurts the breastfeeding. It also has a negative effect on breastfeeding. Therefore, you have to tell the specifically mother weight loss is very physiological. In every baby, it happens. It's not only for your baby. 10% right? weight loss is very normal within first 14 days and then he will recover on his own. If it is not so, you have to take some remedy. Right? Then after 14 days, he will re-achieve the birth date and there are onwards, he will achieve 20 to 40 grams per day. Right? So the thing that I want to highlight is don't stress on weight loss because it hurts the mother. So just say it's a physiological thing. Everybody, every newborn loses about 10% within 14 days and he or she will recover on his own, right? If it is not so, you have to take a remedial action. Otherwise, it's, you don't have to do anything. They will recover on their own. Right. So dehydration fever, uh, mothers, a lot of complaints about dehydration fevers. So babies usually healthy, they are very active, they are feeding vigorously, right? So this occurs three or four days of life due to poor, uh, poor feeding, right? So uh, feeding is very vigorous, so maybe due to inadequate breast milk, maybe due to technique is not correct, so always differentiate from sepsis. In sepsis, babies behave in a different way, but in this one, babies are completely behaving in normal way, but they are a bit dehydrated and urine output is reduced. Uh, 
uh, and they are vigorously looking for feeds, right? So baby should be dressed with loose cotton clothes and uh, always look at the baby is active and alert. So that means baby is not septic, right? So problem is respiratory system. So see the uh, see if the rate is if the rate up to sixty is normal for newborns, right? And uh, see whether the grunting is present. Grunting is very significant for finding of respiratory distress and lower chest syndrome. Those are also very significant and uh, respiratory distress can cause the central cyanosis, right? So in uh, premature babies. If the maturity is less than 37, you may find highland membrane disease, or you call it now surfactant deficient lung disease. Sometimes, uh, by mistake, uh, uh, pediatric households may have discharged a premature baby. So, when they go home, the baby might be brought to you with respiratory distress. So, you just check the maturity. If the maturity is less than 37, if the chest in growing are there, and uh, respiratory rate is more than 60, and baby's skin is also premature, mature, not mature enough. Uh, that indicates the baby is having surfactant deficient lung disease. And there are some risk factors for surfactant deficient lung disease. If the mother is uh, diabetic, and if the mother is hypothyroidism, if the mother is uh, having uh, gestational diabetes mellitus, all those things are. And if the if even even the baby is term, the baby has had a delivery with uh, hypoxia. I mean, with of a, a disturbed delivery with birth asphyxia that might precipitate surfactant uh, deficient lung disease. So that that you may have to. There's no solution that you can give. You may have to admit the patient back to the ward, even after even after the patient has been discharged from the ward. So you have to readmit the patient to ward for treatment. Right. So, characteristics they are very tachypnic, nasal pharynx is there, subcostal and intervals retractions are, cyanosis is there, and the expiratory grunting is very common and very significant, right? So, when you uh, take an x ray, you can see lung volume is decreased, therefore, you get a bell shaped thorax, air bronchogram can be seen, and very hazy brown glass like appearance is found in the chest x ray, right? Of a club, right? So, therefore, whatever it is, you have to admit the child back to the ward for treatment. So, sometimes when the mothers had prolonged rupture of membrane, prolonged rupture of membrane, and mothers had uh, untreated urinary tract infections, right? Uh, even after baby is discharged from ward, immature or mature babies, they when they go home in two to three, three days' time, they might develop respiratory distress with severe chest uh, uh, drawing and uh, high respiratory rate, right? So risk factors is premature rupture of membrane, prolonged labor, premature rupture of membrane for 80, more than 18 hours, prolonged labor and unclean vaginal examinations, foul smelling lyco and maternal fever with, as I told you, untreated uh, urinary tract infections, babies can present with congenital pneumonia. So in the congenital pneumonia also, you see uh, x-rays, uh, hazy, and uh, you get a uh, white color patches throughout the x-ray, which uh, marks the, uh, which marks the uh, pneumonic patches all over the place. So, Positive organism of group B, streptococcus, gram negative organism, E. coli, Krebs cell, and pseudomonas. So, as I told you, clinical manifestation will be respiratory distress, recurrent apneic attacks, right? They can often asphyxiate, uh, uh, they are often asphyxiated and sick at birth, prolonged capillary feeding time, and hypothermia. And so, you have to re admit the patient back to the ward. And sometimes in term babies, uh, meconium aspiration is common, right? So, uh, if the uh, de delivery, if you found meconium on the delivery, so you have to suspect meconium aspiration. So, rather than discharging the baby, you have to find out whether the meconium is really aspirated, whether the baby is in distress, 
whether the X-ray has the typical appearance of meconium, and then we'll treat them. So 10 to 15% of births, meconium stained amniotic fluid, 5% will get meconium aspiration pneumonia. So out of that thing, 30% requires mechanical ventilation. Uh, now our setups are developed, therefore we can, uh, without, I mean, uh, uh, we can, most of the time we can survive meconium aspiration babies, right? So risk factors for meconium aspiration, placental dis dysfunction, placental insufficiency, fetal hypoxia, antipartum hemorrhages, post-maturity baby, and sometimes lysiris and sometimes abnormal presentation. Anything which can cause distress on the baby can present with meconium aspiration. So if you find any evidence of respiratory distress in term baby, and uh, when the baby is brought to you, you might suspect meconium aspiration and re admit the baby for treatment. Right? So you get cotton wool shaped appearance throughout the x ray, which indicates that meconium is found in the chest x ray. Right? So, periodic breathing, the patients are really worried about this. Baby take normal breaths. Intermittently, he or she takes a bit of a fast breaths, one or two, and then breaths. Uh, very rapidly for a few seconds, then pauses and then resumes normal rhythmic breathing pattern, right? Brief pauses should be less than 10 seconds. Then normal breathing pattern, once again, restarted. Not associated in bradycardia or most common in preterm. Not associated in bradycardia or any other, other vital signs. Most common preterm babies, so they will resume their normal breathing pattern, so which is called periodic breathing pattern, very common presentation in private practice. Parents are really worried and alarmed. So they bring the baby to you, you know, to take the good history and detect whether it's a periodic breathing or not. If it's a periodic breathing, you have to tell them this is this happens when the respiratory center is not mature. So with time it will settle and you have to send them back home after giving reassurance, right? So transient tachypnea of the newborn, that happens most of the time. Uh, when the babies are term, babies are delivered through the vaginal canal, they are being squeezed in the vagina. So the, 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 the fluid in the lungs is reabsorbed very fast and naturally when the babies are squeezed. But in the cesarean section, they are being artificially taken from the abdomen. So babies are not being squeezed. So lungs are full of fluid. And uh, lungs are wet, so therefore the wet lungs will have a bit of an alveolar collapse. Therefore, they give uh, alveoli is bit uh, the air exchange alveolus bit number is bit limited. Therefore, uh, li limited number of alveoli bit exhausted in exchanging gas. Therefore, they end up in tachypnea. Right? So, benign self-limited respiratory disorder characterized by mild respiratory distress immediately after the usual full term and well looking common in those delivered by cesarean section, right? Uh, and not that common in normal urgent delivery, right? So, uh, and results from slow absorption of lung fluid peaks about 36 hours of life, resolution within 24 to 72 hours, but it's very, sometimes may be difficult to identify from group B streptococcus, therefore always take X-ray and do other tests too differentiate whether it's a TTN or uh, group is a professor or congenital pneumonia, right? Problems in cardiovascular system, which is very also very important topic. So always uh, look for the history and examination. Always, if you're suspecting a cardiovascular system, it can, uh, problem in cardiovascular system, it can be a cyanotic congenital heart disease or a cyanotic one. Right? If it is a most probably an asymptomatic one, you find a very good murmur. Right? If you get a good murmur, always see the preductal and postductal saturations are normal. So murmur, check for the pre and postductal saturations. Right? What is preductal? Preductal is right hand. It's pre called preductal. That is uh, oxygen before going to the brain is called preductal. So you get the preductal saturation in the right hand. Right, so see the preductal situation. It should be above ninety-five, and check the postductal situation. That is left lower limb. So if it is, if you find a murmur, 
you are getting something on the screen. So, uh, if you find a murmur, uh, okay, if you find a murmur, always check for pre-ductal and post-ductal saturation. That is, pre-ductal left, sorry, right arm, and post-ductal is left leg. So, if that is, if that is above 95, you don't have to worry. And if pre-ductal saturation and post-ductal saturations are, uh, less than 95 with a murmur, so you have to be cautious. That means you need an echocardiogram to assess the murmur, right? And if the preductal saturations, uh, if the pre, uh, what do you call, uh, pre and post are both low, you have to be cautious about the heart disease. So you have to end up in get an echocardiogram done. If the preductal saturation is normal, 95, 96, and postductal, that is left leg is less. So we'll say preductal is 95, postductal is 85 or something like that. That means the baby is having persistent pulmonary hypertension. You get what I said? That is preductal is right arm. If the right arm is somewhere around 95 or 96, and the post is left leg, somewhere around 85 or 86, which is about five lesser than the preductal. That means baby is having some cardiac anomaly, which is called the persistent pulmonary hypertension, right? If preductal and post are both low, it is a clue for cyanotic heart disease, right? Therefore, always if you find a murmur, always check the preductal, post -ductal saturations. If you find a central cyanosis, that is tangy cyanose, always you have to do a echo immediately to find that is a, a cyanotic heart and the type of the patient, right? So, simple. So, preductal, postductal, and saturation. Then, so sometimes child might present to you with murmur plus respiratory distress poor feeding, hepatomegaly and tachycardia. That means baby has cardiac lesion which has gone into heart failure. So at your level, so if you have identified there's a heart lesion, but the lesion is not, prob not a problem, but you have identified there's a lesion and you have identified that baby has gone to heart failure, that is enough, you have to refer to higher center or refer to ward and admit the patient for further management, right? So there are various heart lesions. So PDA is one of the common that we can find. That is even patient, uh, patent, term and preterm, most common in preterm. There's a left to right shunt, which will make the lungs wet and baby will find a bit of a distress in respiratory distress. So small PDAs are asymptomatic and large PDAs, left ventricular hypertrophy and biventricular hypertrophy. So most of the time, PDAs, we, uh, PDAs, we, we try to close the PDA by giving paracetamol and proof. And most of the time, we, we, it's, the treatment will be successful. If we don't uh, get it closed by paracetamol and proof and ibuprofen, we will refer to cardiac centers like LRH, right? Or then they will decide the mode of treatment, maybe ligation, maybe uh, surgical closure, right? Hepatology of fellows, those things are so on, but the prominent feature will be cyanosis. So in the case of cyanosis, we are not going to deal with cyanotic heart disease. We just do the echo and refer to uh, experienced cardiac centers like LRH for further management, right? So in the uh, central nervous system, when we are talking about central nervous system, Birth asphyxia. Now the uh, birth asphyxia is not that common because we are monitoring the fetal and maternal well-being very closely. Therefore, when the baby is uh, going into hypoxia and when the baby is going to stress, we do intervention and get the babies out as much as possible. But still, there are some cases of perinatal asphyxia is found in 
you need the tertiary setup, right? So, so we uh, when the baby uh, when it asphyxiates and insult of the fetus of the newborn due to lack of oxygen and uh, lack of perfusion uh, to various in organ 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 levels, including the brain, right? We have to establish efficient breathing in one minute of age with hypoxia with hypoxia and uh, uh, will end up in uh, brain damage and multiple organ damage. So, uh, uh, I mean, uh, so APGA is the most uh, practical uh, measuring, measuring uh, uh, tool for asphyxia, but in case of preterm babies and babies with birth trauma and congenital neurological abnormalities, uh, APGA is very difficult to uh, measure, right? But anyway, APGA is the most, uh, I mean, practical tool that we use to measure the uh, amount of uh, asphyxia, right? So asphyxia can occur in antepartum uh, level, intrapartum and postnatal period, whatever it is, it's our duty to prevent that, right? So in uh, antepartum conditions, abnormal maternal oxygenation, severe anemia, cardiopulmonary disease, and uh, those things will contribute. Inadequate placental perfusion, severe hypertension, and congenital infection and abnormalities play a role. Then, interpartum events, interruption of the umbilical circulation, do not cause prolapse, those are also contribute for interpartum events. Inadequate placental perfusion, rupture of placenta, uterine lap rupture, and abnormal uterine contraction also is a role then right so whatever it is when you uh, place it birth asphyxia uh, if the birth asphyxia has affected the brain you call it hy hy hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy the more serious complication of perinatal asphyxia that's a neurological sequelae uh, after birth asphyxia so hypoxia impairs cerebral oxidative mechanism and is myocardial depression, this leads to fail in cerebral blood flow. And then ischemia of the uh, brain tissue occur, persistence of hypoxia increase, anaerobic glycolysis, which leads to lactic acid, which will worsen the situation, which have a negative impact on heart, as well as kidney, as well as gut, as well as every tissue in the body. Worsening of lactic acidosis, if not corrected on time, causes loss of cerebral vascular autoregulation, which will worsen the matter and which will cause ischemia worse, right? So, most of the time, prolonged partial episode of asphyxia is because of abduction placenta. That is very common in our setup. And usually it causes diffuse cerebral necrosis. Clinical dysphagia may be persist, present in form of seizure and paresis. So, anyway, what it is, according to clinical picture, we grade them. We call it sonnet staging of hypoxia. Grade 1, which is mild. So, level of consciousness is irritable or hyper alert, muscle tone normal or hypertonia, tender reflexes increased, seizures is not there, and complex reflexes normal. The prognosis will be good, uh, almost similar to a normal baby. Then in grade two, level of consciousness will be lethargic, muscle tone will be hypotonic, uh, the tender reflexes are increased, seizures will be there. So in grade one, there won't be seizures, but in grade two, there are seizures. Then complex reflexes are weak and Prognosis will be, uh, I mean, not normal. We don't see colleagues, they are grade three severe, very bad prognosis, right? Right, in neonatal seizures, that indicates that cerebral damage has occurred, right? So immature brain is more likely to develop seizures, not similar to adults. So most of the time, the uh, myelination has not been completed, therefore, uh, damage is a bit severe, right? So, in causes of neonatal seizures, in one to four days, hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy, in intravascular, intraventricular hemorrhage, drug toxicity like certain drugs taken by mother, and acute metabolic disorders are the causes. Then, four to 15 days, infection, CNS infection like meningitis, metabolic disorders like hypoglycemia, hypocalcemia uh, will be there. And benign neonatal conversion also 
plays a role and sometimes Kernic terrace also even it is not that common now it also uh, it was a was those days right so in two to eight weeks once again infection head danger inherited disorders of cortical development are the causes right so whatever you see it is neonatal conversions may not be presenting to you typically it may present you in eye rolling movements tongue biting movements and so many abnormal ways right so eye rolling movements tongue biting or cyclical movements are also way of presenting of uh, neonatal conversions right so facial nerve palsy that is when you see a face the 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 uh, uh, when the when the child cries the face diverted to normal uh, normal facial nerve side that in this case its left side is normal Right, so face is mouth is diverted to left side. So right side eyes cannot be closed. Right side mouth is diverted to left side. That means right right side facial nerve no damage has occurred. Right, so that's most probably in the birth trauma. Right, lower motor type pollution. It might uh, uh, severity may be variable. Difficulty sucking, drooling of feed on affected side most is all spontaneously within weeks but sometimes if uh, it is not uh, recovering within expected time we may have to use prednisolone we may have to get the neurologist opinion we may have to get, get nerve stimulation tests done right nerve stimulation has to be done to recover fast right so really uh, parents are really worried and concerned about the appearance and the uh, nerve policy but once again it needs some time to recover and you have to counsel the parents and stage uh, you have to explain them the treatment is not just by one day or two days you can't recover but it will take some time you have to explain them right okay then spinal defects so many varieties are there so even you find in if you find some kind of abnormality in the spine whether it is spina bifida or spina bifida occulta or tough of hair or lipoma it's always better to do a scan scan of the uh, spine and differentiate the type of the lesions can be spina bifida Right. right so even the uh, even you find any midline defect always do a spine of, of the uh, scan, uh, scan of the spine and get it sorted out whether it's a spina bifida or spina bifida occulta whatever it is uh, and refer to neurosurgery there are various types right so and so whatever it is you are not going to handle it you just do a scan and make sure that some spinal de spinal cord defect is there and refer to neurosurgery right then Encephalocele, that also you know. Cranial meningocele or myelomeningocele most often occur in the occipital area. Once again, you are not going to manage, you just refer to neurosurgeon. But what, whatever it is, you have to tell the parents that it's a complex process. You need to, you need some time to treat the baby, and it's not a very, I mean, rapid recovering thing. You need to be patient and oblige with the treatment line and get the treatment done and uh, there are, will be other multidisciplinary actions will also be followed like physiotherapy and uh, the other system has to be screened and development uh, follow-up also has to be accompanied with the treatment right 
So then herbs palsy injury to the fifth and sixth cervical. Now that's also brachial herbs palsy, brachial plexus injury. Most of the time occurs in normal delivery of the large babies, right? Injury to fifth and sixth cervical nerves associated with difficult delivery. Frequently, babies weighing uh, 3.54 kilograms, like large babies. No spontaneous arm movement on the on one side. Forearm is extended and pronated. These improve in 90% of cases, but if there's no recovery after three months, always get the plastic surgeon's opinion and need, need to be explored surgically. But in uh, your setup, if the, uh, I mean, if, when the baby is born, if, uh, when you have detected the spots, it's always better to get a higher uh, baby should be referred to higher center and get their opinion about the management. You know it's a palsy, so sometimes they start very light physiotherapy, but it's also under uh, uh, under uh, rheumatologist opinion. Or if the rheumatologist can't set it within six three months, always better to get a plastic surgery. So get, therefore, better to refer to a higher center for their opinion. Otherwise, you will won't be able to recover it fully, right? Right, jitteriness, you very common finding in neonates. Tremor that is similar sensitive and can be stopped by passively flexing the affected limb. So how, how does it differ from uh, conversion? When you, in a case of conversion, you can't stop it by passively holding it. Conversion will occur, but in jitteriness, you can stop it, right? Jitterness is not accompanied by autonomic changes. There won't be any sweating, there won't be any eye rolling movements, there won't be any change in the heart rate, just jitterness only, right? right then, uh, sometimes can be associated with hypoglycemia, hypoglycemia, and IVH, intraventricular hemorrhage. Therefore, if you find a jittery baby, always check their uh, glucose levels, calcemic levels, and we uh, scan, do a scan of the uh, brain just to see whether the baby's uh, baby is having IVS. Sometimes it can be jitterness can be a feature of meningitis also. Therefore, the baby is uh, generally not well. Always try to do a uh, septic screen to exclude meningitis. Right? There are problems in abdomen. Vomiting. Vomiting can be due to gastric irritation by amniotic fluid, maternal blood, so, so many. Therefore, always better to give a, if the, if the child vomits frequently just after delivery, always better to give a gastric wash and see, right? If, uh, if, we, if, the, we, if the vomiting is non-bilious, you don't have to worry that much, just give a uh, gastric wash and see. If it is persisting, you may have to further investigate. Gastric irritation by solid maternal blood is maybe due to crack bleeding nipple, antipartum hemorrhage, baby may, be pa may pass malina stools rather than meconium. Therefore, you know that's a uh, irritation by solid maternal blood. Then gastroesophageal reflux. That's due to overfeeding and improper feeding. So when the gas gets accumulated in the abdomen, it's very uneasy for the baby. They usually vomit with a lot of gastric contents which is which will make the baby uneasy right so effortless after feed in on lying flat right so always see whether a uh, child is, is, is vomiting is not that forceful if it is forceful always investigate do an ultrasound scan and see if there are any obstructions right if it settle and the feeding technique is correct right or sometimes might settle it uh, down down, right so you have, uh, just keep it in mind whether you have excluded any GI obstruction and CNS infection. So see, examine and see whether the baby is otherwise normal, right? Right. Bowel pattern and constipation frequency of stooling and breastfeed can vary from where every feeds babies might pass stools, right? Sometimes watery stools with a bit of a yellowish uh, nodules like so so those things are called breast milk stool that is normal sometimes mothers may misdiagnose it for uh, for diarrhea so just make them reassure that it's not diarrhea, it's normal stools but 
uh, in uh, breast milk stores may be very frequent with bit of acidic water secretions. In uh, formula feeds, it might be occurring once in three days. Therefore, uh, you get very loose, uh, paripeta like stores in breastfeed. That's normal. Sometimes mother might mistake through diarrhea, right? So, constipation is uncommon in newborn. It, constipation occurs. You also, uh, first thing you have to do is check whether the baby has undergone uh, thyroid screening if the baby's TSH level is normal because hypothyroidism or constipation is one of the presenting way of hypothyroidism. And the other thing is you have to ask the mother whether the baby has passed meconium within first 24 hours. If it is not so, you are giving a clue for her strong disease and do the further investigations. Get the opinion from the surgical team, right? Failure to pass urine if the hydration is normal. There's, I mean, no way that baby is not going to pass urine. Always uh, check the bladder is full. If the bladder is full, you don't have to worry. Just give a small stimu stimulation to mid aspect, mid aspect of thigh and allow the baby to pass urine. If uh, baby after birth, most babies widen the first. The first, but all babies must pass urine by 48 hours of age. Babies with delayed passage of urine should be investigated for obstructive uropathy and renal agencies, but most of the time they pass, right? Normal babies wipe urine 6 to 12 times per day, right? Some babies cry before passing it. That's just to make pressure to open the sphincters. If they cry before passing urine, you don't have to worry. But if they cry while passing the urine, you have to look into that maybe child may be having urine tract infection right so sometimes after passing urine also they might cry because the, the nappy is up it, right okay then most of the time parents will come to you saying that babies cry during passing urine always get the timing properly if they, they cry before passing the urine there's nothing much you can say that is because of the tightness of the sphincters with the time they will overcome the tightness and they will settle but while passing the urine if they cry just examine the genitalia there might be some irritation in the genitalia irritation factors there might be excoriation in the genitalia or it can be due to urine tract infection right therefore ask the timing properly right Then umbilical sepsis. So when umbilicus is infected, you get a wall air ring like that is a ring of infected tissue around the umbilicus, right? So that is very dangerous. Umbilical cord normally falls in off in seven to ten days and wound heals about fifteen days. Redness and swelling around the umbilicus, we call it wall air ring. And sometimes there might be pus discharge. This is very dangerous. It might spread the infection to umbilicus and uh, it might lead to portal vein thrombosis, right? Therefore, just identify it and clean the space and start antibiotic as soon as possible, right? If redness is surrounded area is less than one centimeter or there are signs of sepsis, then in addition to local therapy, systemic antibiotics should be started as manager of sep uh, septicemia, right? Complication is sepsis, you might end up with cellulitis and portal vein thrombosis is the most dangerous complication. Umbilical granulomas, I mean, you just have to portray this, then it will settle on their own, right? Uh, how is our timing? Uh, huh? How am I allowed to go? How many minutes? Huh? Right, okay. Right. Necrotizing enterocolitis is characterized by necrosis of the intestinal wall, is serious life threatening condition that is being diagnosed with increasing frequency in pre frequent premature babe infants. In especially, it's a condition where uh, premature babies get their bowels distended and passing blood stained stools and persistent vomiting. When sometimes we do, uh, tend to discharge premature babies home, right? Because we can't be keeping them until they reach their maturity. But uh, when the weight gain is good, when the baby's uh, development is good, satisfied, we can discharge it, right? 
So when they go home, sometimes they might come to you with distended abdomen. Mother might say, baby's apathy, baby's activities are less, and baby sometimes ceases his or her breathing with a bit of abdominal distension. And you might see some stools, uh, blood stain stool in the blood stain stools. So that can be a clue to neck. Neck is due to characterized by neck cause of the intestinal wall. It's a serious life threatening condition might end up in perforation. Therefore, you have to identify it. This is basically premature babies are more liable for neck, but sometimes term babies who has had hypoxia and some problems like meconium also liable for neck. Therefore, identify that features will be apathy, apneic attacks, abdominal distension, right? And passing of blood stain source, right? So, fact, uh, I mean, uh, contributory factors include perinatal asphyxia, low abgas, low, uh, surfactant deficient lung disease, sepsis, enteral, early starting of the enteral feeds also might contribute for neck, right? So, when the gut is not mature, but we are trying to feed the fellow, so that might end up in necrosis, right? And congenital cardiac disease like PDA, right? because PDA will shunt the blood from uh, left side to right side, so which will make the gut necros, which will make the gut hypoxic. Therefore, it is more liable to get necrotizing enterocolitis. Right? Relative ischemia of the intestinal tract that is due to hypotension and use of umbilical catheters might also cause damage to the blood flow of the intestine, which can expose to hypoxic heart in the uh, gut, which will uh, end up in necros necrotizing enterocolitis, right? So, as I told you, abdominal distension, decreased bowel sounds, poor feeding, increased gastric residuals, blood seek by blood seek by long chain, bloody or mucoid stores are the features of neck, right? Right. So, metabolic problems, we'll go through metabolic problems as soon as possible. Jaundice is not that, uh, I mean, as you see in the, see the jaundice, uh, you have to be a bit vigilant and you have to assess it. So, uh, common problem is, and most of the time is benign, but I will show you a chart. Uh, so, what you have to do is assess the severity of the jaundice, right? So, pathological versus physiological, right? So physiological, jaundice appears in two to three days, right? Pathological appears in first 24 hours. So rising of the bilirubin is very fast in pathological. That is more than five milligrams per deciliter per day. In physiological, that's less than five milligrams per deciliter per day, right? Right, so uh, if the uh, bilirubin level is very rapidly spreading, right? If the baby is becoming very jaundice, better to do basic screen, uh, basic screen, uh, screen test like serum bilirubin level and blood group, and uh, send the baby to hospital for further evaluation. If the face is jaundice, that means uh, uh, bilirubin level is five to seven. If the chest is there, so bilirubin level is ten, right? If the lower abdomen is and thigh is there, it is. 12. So, if the soul and palm, that is more than 15. That's at the level of chest and abdomen. I think you may have to admit the baby and uh, start for the baby, right? So, this is the graph that we use. So, areas are shown 1, 2, uh, 3, 1, 2, 3, 4. Right? If you, if you get into the level 2 and come into the level 3, it's better to admit and do the necessary, right? So, if the bilirubin level is rising and if the bilirubin go crosses the blood brain barrier and get deposited in the uh, basal ganglia and hippocampal and it will be disastrous. So baby lose the tone, then there will be no tone control. So that will end up in kernicterus. Uh, bilirubin and cephalopathy will end up in cerebral palsy, right? Therefore, don't allow the bilirubin to rise. So if the bilirubin is uh, rising rapidly, admit the baby correct the hydration, do a proper hydration and start phototherapy as soon as possible, right? If the baby is very rising and chart the bilirubin and see if the baby needs 
double dose, single dose, triple dose, we start it immediately. If the baby needs exchange transfusion, do it as soon as possible. Don't wait for, don't wait for the report. If you feel that baby's bilirubin is rap rising rapidly, just start uh, exchange transfusion as soon as possible. Right. Right. So hypoglycemia, most common metabolic disorder in terms, if the blood sugar is less than 20, 45 milligrams per deciliter, you call it hypoglycemia. Or if it is less than 2.2 millimoles per deciliter, you call it hypoglycemia, right? So, so why, why are we worried about hypoglycemia? And that is neuroglycopenia. Neuroglycopenia, it causes neurological damage, which is irreversible. So if you found Baby is hypoglycemic, just treat the fellow uh, even without symptoms, right? So, if the baby is a low birth weight, that is below 2.5 kilograms, and if the baby is a preterm, less than 35 weeks, if the, uh, if the baby's mother is suffering from gestation diabetes mellitus, right? Uh, if, the, if the hematic disease is there, and so check the RBS, random blood sugar, too early pre-feed, right? And uh, babies on who are exposed to sepsis and birth asphyxia, shock, right? Uh, and mother receiving labitalol and nifidipine, right? Uh, so check the pre-feed RBS too early. And if it is low, less than 42 milligrams per deciliter for the treat. If the babies are symptomatic, you have to get the baby admitted and treat with 10% dextrose. Once the baby is stable, you have to uh, replace 25% of the total volume of 10% dextrose by oral feed and stabilize the blood sugar. And gradually, you have to withdraw the IV and turn it to oral. If the babies are asymptomatic, you can always treat with breast milk. Or if the breast milk is not adequate, in that case, you can use. Even for the term babies, you can use premature formula because in premature formulas, sugar content is a bit higher than the normal formula. So usually in premature formulas, they get uh, 100 uh, ml contains about 82 kilocalories. So this, uh, while giving the breast milk, you can top up on uh, premature formulas if, he, uh, if the baby is asymptomatic. If the baby is symptomatic, there's no excuse. You can add, you have to admit and the baby with 10% dextrose. If, if the baby is not recovering with 10% dextrose, you can have to increase the percentage into 12.5. Even if it's not responding for 12.5, you have to put a umbilical line or whatever central line and go up to 15% of dextrose. Then, uh, even the baby is not recovering for 15% of dextrose, you have to find out the cause. Most of the time, its cause is hyperinsulinism. So, you have to started and tinsulin drugs, right? So the message is don't let the baby be hypoglycemic, it will end up in neuroglycopenia, which is a irreversible damage, which will have a sequelae and child might be having permanent neurological sequelae later in life, right? So signs and symptoms of hypoglycemia, jitteriness, tachypnea, cyanosis, apnea, seizures, cardiac arrest, irritability, hypotonia, lethargy, high pitch cry. Poor sucking and sweating, <clears throat> right? So prevention of hyperglycemia is always preventable. So always start feeds as soon as possible. Don't wait for one hour, 30 minutes. If you have a chance to start the feeds within 10 or 15 minutes, just start it within 10 or 15 minutes soon after the delivery, right? And hypothermia. Hypothermia will start a sequel of events leading to hypoglycemia, therefore prevent hypothermia as soon as possible, right? Congenital hypothyroidism, those are no, not common now, but it's also, it was common those days. Therefore, we have started uh, neonatal screening for hypothyroidism, which is a THS yield pick test. Now, I think we don't find Hypothyroidism that much, right? So it's also correctable metabolic disorder which have a direct impact on the brain development. So, so do a screening test as soon as possible. If you found it, hypothyroid, start treatment as soon as possible. Don't delay, right? Right. Uh, 
and then I then I could hire. So I think uh, time factor is limited, though, even though we have a lot of things to discuss. So I will share the slides with you. You can get the slides. I think uh, too much talking will not keep attention now. So therefore, uh, by this point, I would like to stop my lecture and I would like to thank Dr. Dinesh and Dr. Manasi and the team of Sri and the, the uh, GMOA, which gives you this uh, chance for the uh, knowledge and the CPD program for, in which I am the vice president for the last four years. And uh, I would like to thank the entire team of uh, Sri and the nation's team for giving this opportunity to speak to you. And uh, I would like to especially thank my senior host, Dr. Kuchira Dasanayaka for uh, making all these slides and preparing these lectures for me. And uh, thank you very, very much for listening to me despite busy schedules i know you are fighting uh, high with the high uh, and fighting with busy schedule with the covid these days but despite this all these problems you had spent some time to listen to me i hope at least you got some time uh, knowledge update from my lecture and thank you very much for listening thanks Thank you very much, sir. That was very informative presentation today. Uh, we are running out of time, but still uh, we'll be able to clear a few queries. Uh, we have got uh, two queries from the participants, sir. Uh, the first question is, uh, how can a mother get her three weeks old baby back to breastfeeding when the baby had been given formula a little after birth due to poor lactating? I'll answer here. Yes, sir. Yes. Uh, the question is, can we get back to breastfeeding after three weeks, is it? Yeah, you can, that's what I told you, it's a, I mean, there are no fast ways of getting back to the normal track in breastfeeding. Uh, so best thing is to, the baby to be seen by you and assess the baby's feeding pattern, right? Then. Now, since the baby has been breastfed for the last three uh, weeks, it's, I mean, MAC2, baby has been adopted to mechanisms. That is, uh, bottle feeding operates under different, uh, bottle feeding operates under different mechanisms. So we have to slowly stop formula feeds, uh, what do you call it? Uh, bottle feeds, bottle feeds, and start cup feeding, right? Cup feeding and breastfeeding, then the, then give a breastfeeding and you can encourage mother to form more and more milk. So that's a slow release of uh, metoclopamide. I mean, it's not good to tell the commercial name, but for your knowledge, I think only one preparation is available that is called digestine. So 40 milligrams, not So that, that pill produce a bit of a milk for mother and then uh, start breastfeeding in, in the proper technique and if the baby is not satisfied from the breastfeeding you can start cup feeds. I know from day one when you stop uh, bottle feeds the volume of milk will not be enough. So in that case you can give breast feeds as well as formula milk from the cup. right? Totally remove the bottle from mother, uh, baby. Then the solution will be breast feeds. If, they, if the baby wants some more, give formula from cup feeds. Then start the metoclopamide slow releasing agent. And uh, as I told you, increase uh, sleeping time, uh, counsel, counsel the mother psychologically, and then she will relax the mother. Don't put heavy burden on the mother. Sometimes we squeeze her breast, we uh, try to give a target for the mother, oh, express 30 ml in two hours, 60 ml in three hours, don't stress the mother. Right now, boy, baby is already in formula, I know that, right? Allow the baby to suck from the breast in a cor under correct uh, technique, then if there's any deficient, give it from formula from the cup and relax the mother and give the, what I told you, the slow metaclopamide solution and uh, arrange her diet and sleeping bed. Avoid unnecessary 
cafe and those kind of uh, uh, food for mother and that will from my experience you can get the mother back to track in one to two weeks time thank you very much sir for this excellent um, information and one more question sir is it recommended to get vaccinated for covid 19 while continuing breastfeeding <laughs> yes it's a practical uh, problem but our advice was if it is below 6 months better not because i know everybody knows nothing will happen to the baby but there are no i mean it's a new disease process right therefore there's no proper documentation is found in the world so best thing if the baby is less than 6 months we can explain the parents the pros and cons about the vaccination so if you don't get the vaccination what will happen mother might get severe variety of covid right therefore uh, what you call discuss the advantages and disadvantage and let them decide my personal opinion is it's always better to give vaccination at any stage but nobody is committed nobody is going to commit therefore we openly say before 6 months think twice but after 6 months definitely you can give before 6 months also, also, also you just discuss the options with the mother saying that these are the i mean there are no known complications of vaccination in the feeding mother but nothing is documented yet because it's a it's a new newly emerged disease right still research has, research has been done but if somebody goes to courts the rare rare side effects what will happen right those are the problems so the fellow might argue in the courts you have recommended vaccine for my mother my wife but he has got this much this this side of effect and this has affected my baby right so there's a very 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 rare incident therefore you just discuss with them you don't tell them directly go and vaccinate don't tell them tell them these are the benefits of the vaccination therefore you decide these are the benefit these are the uh i mean uh, dangers of not getting vaccine therefore if you don't get the vaccine the mother might get severe uh, covid variety which might end up in uh, ventilation most of the time ventilated babies ventilated mothers won't survive so therefore you give them an open open option to decide so my personal advice is if you are a good friend of mine if you are a very close person of mine i advise is go and get the vaccination and then you risk it right so because i if you are a good friend of mine i know that if something goes uh, wrong very rarely so you won't sue me therefore i will recommend you to go and get vaccine but if you are not a known person to me i will explain you these are the benefits of the vaccine so you decide what to do okay thank you sir we got few to curry sir uh, what is the drug of choice for umbilical sepsis Two the uh, one more query uh, could you please elaborate the correct technique or ways of burping up to breastfeeding yeah best thing is to place the baby in prone position prone position and tap the pillow from back so that will burp the pillow over it thank you very much sir so here we are concluding our sessions today and i would like to thank dr sanjeeva tenakon for his excellent presentation on behalf of gmoa and society for health research and innovation also we would like to present a token of appreciation to dr sanjeeva tenakon thank you very much sir, for joining us today uh, here we are signing off uh, thank you all for your participation have a good day stay safe thank you Oh, dear God. Mm-hmm. Oh. Oh.